Right, the stalker path phenomenon. This is a phrase I now have to justify in the course of the next hour or so. What sort of phenomenon is this? Um, this is the first picture I ever took of a stalker path with the classic zigzag flight. And as is the way of these things, um, firstly, I wasn't there to look at stalker paths. And secondly, it's the best picture I've ever taken of a stalker path. You know, things always go downhill from the start, don't they? I was there to pursue my other main interest in the mountains in rock slope failures. Um, and this, I had to wait for a couple of hours for the sun to come round onto it. And I never even joined up this bit of the hillside with the adjacent bit where the zigzags are. But you can just about see where the stalker path carries on um, up that skyline above my beautiful rock site of Vania. Yeah. Uh, seen from opposite, I'll now see if I can find my cursor. You can see the zigzags ever so elegantly cut. Very, it's like precision engineering, like surgeon with a scalpel up to the top of the first brow. And then it carries on uh, from the top of the brow some way up the ridge to the next brow, and then you're on your own to promenade along this ridge and um, enjoy the scenery, uh, which is a point we'll come back to. That is a stalker path in the inner recesses of what was the great Glen Cuick estate, now sadly drowned out by the Cuick Dam, and it's one of many on that estate. Here's another, which you can easily get up onto from directly behind where the lodge was, through the initial rhododendron jungle. And that happens to be Hamish Brown's favourite stalker path. I don't have good pictures of it, but the satellite image gives you an impression of these delicious curlicues to heading up. And here's a third one on the estate, which I throw in for good measure because I haven't been up it. I've got a picture from opposite and even zooming in, I can't see this path. It has so fallen out of use and um, it's the back way up onto the Great Clooney Ridge. Only by looking at the two satellite image sources and the OS map have I managed to locate it and plot it on for you. I must go and do it someday. Um, Glen Cuick Lodge, um, they can just see it in the distance there on its wonderful lockside setting. Um, one of the great large estates, uh, one of the great builders of stalker paths. Indeed, not just stalker paths, but estate carriage roads and hill tracks and so forth. This is just the array on the north side of the estate. There's the same again and even better on the south side. Um, if anyone knows Grimble, the Deer Forest of Scotland, uh, a valuable compendium of his 50 years of stalking, being invited to the Round of Forest Estates, he uh, unusually singles out this estate to proclaim the 130 miles of carriage drives and Pony paths. Notice this phrase he uses, pony paths. Um, and he doesn't mention the paths in general as he goes around the estates. One or two others, he will just touch upon them briefly. But this is a rare mention of this great achievement of path making. This estate also lets me point out the, the differences between um, what I would think of as a stalker path, pure and simple. Uh, of course, none of them are, and more general purpose roads, carriage roads and hill tracks. So there in the corner of the screen is this particular hill track, uh, much wider than a stalk path, um, perfectly capable of taking wheeled vehicles and going over a fairly low pass and down to the next glen. Um, so that's general estate communications. And it has a lovely check down forge, which half survives there, easily wide enough for a wheeled vehicle. Whereas at the other end of Glencoe, we have on today's map uh, a bifurcation of a stalker's, uh, not a stalker's path, but an estate track that completes the circuit of the glens and an old hill path that the people used following where the beasts went over a high pass down into Glen Shield. And on the satellite image, you can see the contrast between find the cursor. This is the made path from that junction. Uh, very regular, very linear. Uh, the course is, is quite obvious. Little details you can see like drainage cuts and stream crossings, whereas the other path, the one that's not made but worn, is a blur uh, because deer don't go single file. Deer go, um, you know, like a 
braided river, sort of multiple channels uh, coming and going. And then the people follow where the deer have, have gone. So a very different character and quality of path there. Now, my study area uh, in this presentation is the Western Glens. Um, and I have not yet extended very much beyond that, just anecdotally. Um, so what can we say about the Highlands at large? Um, I have a hunch that stalker spars are widely distributed. By the way, stalker path, Roland um, said at the outset that um, I have this funny way of, of doing it without the apostrophe in all one word. Bear with me. If, if this is riling you, bear with me until the end and I will justify uh, this term. Um, I think they are less common in the Southern Highlands where perhaps the pattern of land ownership, the development of the estates, the, the proximity to the cities, the whole atmosphere was a little bit different. Um, and some of the moorland areas, they seem to be a bit sparser. But then uh, we have to remember, we have fishing paths uh, to, to the hill locks and we have grouse moor paths. Um, so, so these paths are made not just in the deer stalking estates. Just to give you a smattering across the rest of the highlands, there's a lovely example on Mar Lodge, not a single zigzag, uh, very well uh, designed and engineered, rising neatly up to that skyline, at a steady gradient, uh, making light of the, of the ascent. And you can see the width of the cut. Um, and the problem is that wherever we have heather slopes, the heather grows downhill out across the path, deflects the deer and the people to the outside edge and even over the edge and it becomes quite uncomfortable. We do need to design some kind of heather flail um, that people can push up and down these paths to restore them. Um, over the other side of the Cairngorms on Glenfeshi, we have a lovely zigzag path abandoned as the estate vehicles now go elsewhere. And that is again, hard to follow in the heather. Uh, one lovely artifact, um, handsome um, stone cundy, slab bridge. Again, wide enough for a small wheel vehicle. But this path uh, goes down into the old pine woods and thick heather and juniper jungle. And you might think, well, is there a path? Where's the path? Is there a path there at all? Um, I actually managed to persevere. The boots find the path. The boots somehow sense where it is meant to be going uh, slightly more level um, and regular uh, surface to go along. I put this one in uh, also in the Eastern Highlands because it's a nice example of a skyline notch. If you want to spot a possible stalker path, if you've lost it and you wonder where it's going around the next corner, if you don't use GPS, um, and please don't use GPS because it's much more fun try to sense where the path should go, sense where they wanted to take it, and then it'll turn up around the corner. Um, so here you have a steepening of the slope, um, a four foot or a six foot burn, and then a steepening on the downhill side. So that's a, a nice little feature to look out for. I can't um, focus in on the study area without giving you a smattering of the mammals, possibly the finest flowering of the stalker path network. Uh, radiating from Amor Lodge and weaving through the, the coals and passes and along some of the crests. Um, and encircling the second highest Mamor Scorovine, the map doesn't quite depict the full circle, but you can, when the snow's off, you can walk right round this mountain on a fairly good path. It's a, it's a real day out. <clears throat> now, Nosas uh, visited, Roland included, um, Nossas visited a pair of stalker paths, handy for the main road to Kyle at Glen Karen Lodge last summer. And I don't know, find my cursor again. I didn't color them in because I hope you can see on the image, there goes the stalker path, lovely regular curve right across the slope, right the way back again, right the way up. And I've dotted it on higher up because the ordnance survey mapping stops there, but we proved it goes somewhat higher. And then we cut across the moor and we found the path head rat. The trouble with the cursor is it will forward click. We came down a very corkscrewy little path and then it picked up the visible one that is mapped and zigzags back down again. Now I was puzzled as to why we have two in close proximity. We, you wouldn't think that deer stalking would require that um, and of course they are rising from the 
front door of the lodge, although with the sale of the land on the north of the road, the start has now been lost. So don't try and find it from the lodge, you won't manage it. You just start from the lay by a bit further down, cut across the bogs. Um, fairly obvious where you pick it up. Um, on the imagery, I have since the visit, I have found um, a pair of tram lines running across the slope and then running right up to a broad summit plateau. And I went up there to check them out a few days ago. And it's a pair of grooves, sometimes eight metres apart. We were actually here at the path head. We thought these were drainage ditches splaying away to protect this path head resting place. But no, they converge, they wind up, then they contour across, then they head up to the summit and they narrow to three metres apart. No path making at all. I have found these sorts of parallel grooves or ditches in one or two other locations um, on the Canic Farah March. But what could they possibly be for? Are they like guide rails to lead you back down to the path head um, in mist? Any ideas welcome. Now, following that visit uh, with much help from Holland and also James in his um, abominable blog creation facility, um, I put up a Nussas blog, which you can see, and that has a lovely, delicious um, slide set illustrating this path, which I will now update uh, with the benefit of this peculiar twin track thing. And buried, lurking in the front page of that blog, you can see a link to the report I did for Nosas on this stalker path phenomenon. And my study area is the Western Glens between Glen Canich, Maladoch, Elkeg, and Glen Caron. And <clears throat> in that study area, fairly compact, uh, fairly similar character across it, um, I found 70 main stalker paths, 15 branches uh, comprising. 156 miles of stalker path making. That's on top of a substantial mileage in green of the hill paths and hill tracks up the glens and over the low coals, linking together uh, estate properties. Now, a big surprise to me um, was the average length is less than two miles and the average height gain you know, is not enormous. So the idea of a stalker's path winding up into the high quarries is not the norm. And of course, that's an average length, so lots of them are very short and don't go very high. For example, um, here's a really sort of dull as ditch water path, purely functional, um, branching off from Strathconnen. Um, I did try and pursue it in the dense heather uh, with a dusting of snow to help guide the way. I don't recommend it. A purely functional stalker's deteriorating on abandoned category. Um, there is a spectrum of some segments that are near pristine in the sense of you get the flavour of how they were when first made, and some completely lost. Um, a number have been rather messed up by machinery. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, there are enough to give a flavour of the height of the heyday. I have, I'm, I'm a geographer, I'm not an archaeologist, major caveat. I have absolutely no archaeological um, qualifications or, or training. Uh, I'm a geographer uh, with an interest in, in the spatial incidents of phenomena. Um, I'm a geomorphologist looking at landscape evolution in the mountain areas. So the stalker paths have just sort of been handy for, as a ways into the hills for me, as with so many people. And this summary table highlights uh, geographically um, huge disparities in stalker path incidents across this one study area. So Achna Shalach area, three times the going rate, um, Strathconnen, Orin, half the going rate. So why these differences? Well, you might think different owners have different aspirations for their land. Perhaps the more traditional long-standing owners were less inclined to um, invest, to bring in you know, shooting parties, talking parties. Um, whereas the new money coming in from the south uh, wanted to um, you know, really transform their landscape, stamp their mark on it, open it up, open it up. Um, but there may be other reasons, there may be other factors. Um, uh, and um, Nicholas, for example, suggested, is it just the terrain? Uh, does some terrain invite stalker's bars and other areas don't? I'd like to 
trace that out across Scotland and see what difference the terrain makes. Uh, but here's a, a vast area of land at one time all under the thumb of Matheson of Ardross. Um, and Grimble's guide to these Highland estates simply tells us that Killellan, with a high density of stalkers' bath, is where the stags like to congregate in the autumn, whereas the interior around Pat and Reverkin is where the hinds like to congregate, of much less interest for deer stalking purposes. Um, and that may be a simple factor in why the density over in the east is half that in the west there. Uh, as befits a good geographer's research study, I've got a, a large um, spreadsheet uh, of data and there are lots of gaps in it. So I would welcome contributions, uh, particularly uh, photo essays uh, on these bars, views from opposite um, and archival material on the various artifacts that we find along the way. And supplementary to that, I've done a mapping history on the invaluable NLS website. Um, Nearly all the paths um, have now made it onto the OS maps, um, but unfortunately, these guys in Southampton are now mapping from their desks and their screens using satellite imagery. Um, and they don't check them out on the ground or consult locally. So there are some mismappings and some still a few omissions. Um, we have a spectrum of dates on the NLS website. <clears throat> Uh, 6 1, um, 1874, the first six inch edition is pretty good. Um, a few changes to the second edition. Uh, that's my gold standard. And then we get fill ins at one inch scale and then we go metric. Now, this is only of partial value to us. It will tell us by when a path exists, give or take recent mismappings. Um, it doesn't tell us how early the path was made. And I think a lot of paths either escaped mapping until quite late on, um, or estate owners were deliberately discouraging their paths from being publicized on maps, um, either by asking the survey not to show them, or I have read accounts of them um, making it very difficult for the surveyors to get onto their land, you know, like only giving them a day to map an entire mountain. So we don't really know when these paths were made. And I'll give you an example from Roland's favourite doorstep hill, um, Ben Varkey, the foot of Strathfarra. There's a path almost to the summit of the outshot Skur of Fulham, and the lower part is on the maps by the Great War. The upper parts don't make it until the metric era. That does not mean that the upper parts were made after the Second World War. Almost certainly they were made between the wars, if possibly not earlier. How we find out when these parts were actually made, big problem. <clears throat> now, I am going to whiz you around the study area um, with seven case studies. Um, obviously, these are some of the better preserved more attractive paths, but they are very different in character. Um, a wonderful thing about stalkers' paths is their, their individuality. They really do have their own persona. Uh, so starting in the southwest, you come up from Dorney up Loch Long to Kalilan um, and Glenelkeig. And as we've seen, this is a high incidence of stalker paths. Every little side valley has its own path up it. They mostly stop midway, just one Find the cursor again, uh, just one goes almost to the summit of a corbett called Furkuk uh, because it rises from the hill paths over to um, Pat. Um, I have a photograph of the Kalilan Lodge, which has since been demolished from Ambali, and that says it's a Wills tobacco estate, not Alexander Matheson. A bit puzzling there as to when Wills came in, but I assume the paths were built under Matheson's. Um, Rain because he has lots of uh, made paths around his Ardross property over in Easter Ross. We're going to go up this particular path to Loch and Yellican, which is a lovely place to, to visit. And the path goes along the shore and then ends on that knoll in the middle of nowhere for no apparent reason. So the start from Glenelkeig uh, has to climb the steep valley side and it's short. This is a two kilometre path, um, but, but it's lovely. It starts promisingly um, in its, you know, as made character, uh, an artifact, a uh, water crossing, 
sort of a very minor modest ford. Um, the purpose is to get the water across the path, um, not to ease your progress. <clears throat> and here's a little constriction where the path has been made through uh, a boulder tumble and cleared away and maybe even a bit of cut. And it is exactly six feet wide, which is the sort of the gauge for, for the, many of these paths, especially in their lower reaches. Uh, and that suggests it was suitable for a light cart and the gradient tends to be reasonably constant for a, a pony and trap or whatever. <clears throat> All right. This is a very good path to show you the artifacts associated with stalker path making. Cut and fill. This is the, the main thing that we are interested in. Any civil engineer will tell you, minimize the muck shift. That's true today with costly machinery uh, and just as true with uh, poorly paid men with picks and shovels. The whoever chooses the line for the path sets it out um, to be cuttable, a cuttable slope. Um, and uh, the cut material, that's the easy bit, is cutting. The cut material is then carefully emplaced to make the embankment. So you think about a six foot wide track with a small vehicle going up it, pony walking up the middle. The inner three feet is cut. The outer three feet are made, built up. So that has to be very carefully placed and consolidated and then surfaced and drained. You may need a bit of extra material uh, uh, over and above your cut. So a few points uh, up this path, we have a borrow pit, not so many, it was a good balance of cut and fill on this path. Some paths you have much bigger borrow pits, um, which by the way, become lovely sites for wildlife today. Um, you know, mosses and frogs and things. You must drain the path. Every possible place where water could get onto it and run down it and erode it has to be circumvented. So the, the path long profile will often have little steps down in it to deflect the water, or where there's a more defined water course, there will be a a slab bridge or a stone cundy or whatever. Um, the path climbs up the valley side, we have zigzags. And they're quite tight zigzags and they have got rather sadly eroded by state vehicles going up and um, motor, motorized vehicles, quad bikes and ATVs and so forth. But these zigzags can still be seen in the landscape um, and they're particularly delightful on this lovely satellite image, which lets us see how the surveyors of this path have chosen a, a, a thick plastering of glacial moraine, glacial till on the valley side, which is a very good material for cutting paths in and for making paths, because the glacial debris is typically a mix of pebbles, rounded pebbles, um, sand, silt, mud, so sand and gravel mix, and it compacts very nicely um, into a, a good durable surface, so long as you keep the water off it. <clears throat> Out onto the moor, and it's now just a sort of a wonder. What I'd like you to think of here, what I'd like you to look at, is not the path, but the adjacent terrain. And imagine crossing that moor without the benefit of a path. And my rule of thumb is that with a good, well-preserved path, um, you can go two or even three times faster than picking your way through the tussocks and the boulders and, and the, the wet bits and everything else, the mess of a typical moor. Drainage. You can see here uh, some nice examples of investment in drainage structures, uh, check down, uh, stone cundies, ditching, uh, and also paving that is designed to shed the water to little ditches either the side. Here's a, a tiny groove of a ditch to help drain the path, which is not really made, it's just stripped to the natural uh, glacial moraine surface. And then we reach Loch Nam Yellican. Anyone know the meaning of Yellican? Well, there you go. Um, and the path carries on round and ends on that hillock in the distance uh, across these nice stepping stones. Um, beautifully made. Uh, in fact, you can walk along this path so rapidly that when you get to these little twist and turn jinks, you have to lean into the curves. Final stretch is across a peaty, haggy area and they've built it up as an unusual turf bank construction. Beyond that knoll, which is a pleasant viewpoint, resting place, picnic spot, you have whatever you have, 
why is there no path carrying on up the next tier onto the plateau above? Uh, it was a real struggle, actually. It's quite steep to find picking a line. Why do they not make a path to get you up onto this lovely plateau? I mean, there'd be lots of deer around here in the back quarries and down in the dips and dells. Well, I happened to meet the young stalker on Killillan and discussed my interests in, in what these paths were for. And what he told me was that he seldom used the paths in stalking the deer. Um, and he basically is culling the deer. They don't have many visiting um, guests uh, stalking on this estate. Um, he just goes across a terrain where he needs to go to get down onto his deer. The path is for the ghillie to bring up today the quad bike uh, with its you know, bucket on the back to put the deer in. In the early days, the ghillie would bring up the pony to an agreed point where they would drag the carcass down to off the hillside. Um, so the path is called a pony path for that reason. The path is not there for the benefit of the stalkers. You read any account of um, traditional highland stalking and it's all about crawling for miles on your belly. You do not walk on a path to get to your deer because they can see you. Um, a very quick mention of the OS name books. Um, Meryl Marshall put me onto these and I'm very grateful to her. They're fascinating. They give you some spellings, they give you meanings. Um, there's a lot of debate about the accuracy, but I, I think they're pretty good. They give you ownerships such as Mathis and Amar Dross. They do not give you anything about the paths because the paths don't have names, except unusually here, um, it mentions at this place, the Turnpike Road from Balmacara leads, presumably through to Glen Canich, crossed out by higher authority and the public road was put in to us. An amusing little thrill, but it is quite difficult to get a handle on what the OS were mapping in these early days. This is 1875, the first edition, not by the way, 1850, that's an error which they confess to and are trying to change. <clears throat> Moving north, the next estate north, a much lower density of stalker paths. Um, at one time under Matheson, but then became a separate ownership uh, at Adale Vendronic. And the path I'm taking you to um, goes up this little shoulder uh, off the main estate track that goes through to Mona. Um, <clears throat> it's short and sweet. You come in past the fishing lock, you branch off, um, quad vehicles go this way today, you get to the old unspoiled path, and then you head up. My companion, who calls herself a plodder, just whisked off ahead and disappeared out of sight. Such is the ease with which you can speed up these zigzags, um, detained by just one single solitary artifact, uh, a little bit of cobbling where a, a small watercourse crosses, and disappearing out of sight at a nice little skyline notch. Um, and we get up onto the shoulder and we have views out north and south, and we wonder why are we here? Why has this path been made to get us onto this medium level ridge? So what we are seeing here is this short, sharp little path, beautifully preserved, not used by the estate. And all we can do is walk along the ridge and then drop down the chimneys of Bendron Egg Lodge. Is that what people are actually doing? Is that what the path was for, to make a circular walk? Because you're too high for the deer. They'll see you coming up that exposed path on that open shoulder. Why is there no estate path, stalker path round the flanks, which is where the deer will be on those grassy slopes above the trackless river Ling? Why are there no such stalker paths up the shoulders of the big mono mountains on the north side of the estate? This is a mystery to me. We just don't know what the motivations, resources uh, of, of the estates were. Now, Akana Shalak, I've already mentioned as being the highest density of paths. And I want to take you up one of my all time favorites, the Breeden and Egan path. You will not thank me for directing you to it because the start is awful. And so you may just prefer to see the slideshow. <laughs> uh, this is um, Lord Wimborne country. This young man inherited enormous wealth um, 
and splashed out on his home estate when this was all the rage, probably late 50s, early 60s, um, the breakup of the great uh, uh, apple across the states. Um, he may have built Achnashelach Lodge. Um, he then moved on um, up Glen and bought Glen Caron Lodge just as it was being built and that estate. He acquired Cool into the north and then um, more land around it. Uh, he, he was an investor, uh, a player in the market. He moved around the map of ownerships. This is the path I want to take you up. If you see that on the satellite image, you, your boots say, get me on that path, ASAP, which we then did. But it is quite peculiarly, starting from the lodge, it wanders off over here, comes up onto the plateau, whereas there was already a good going path to almost the same spot, going down to Birnus Bothian, back out to Strath, Karanas Achen T, with another branch coming over the skyline and round there. So you weren't short of paths getting in here. And there are more things to puzzle about as well. Let's just fill in the picture. The very first map, 1875, we have a path almost completed across that col and uh, a zigzag path up the northeast shoulder. The next map links those two path heads together through the Witch Hag Col, and the next map again gives us the skyline walk along Skunfetig, which is one of the finest paths in the land. <clears throat> My path works its way round the back and was never mapped until the latest 25k. It was as built, something you could easily get onto from the lodge. Unfortunately, the ford and footbridge have disappeared to Karen floods. So you now have to come in from uh, the uh, Craig Hostel end and pick up the forestry road, which is thoroughly boring and depressing uh, to get to the start. Uh, I cycled it and even that is so this is what the current 25k shows, a um, beautiful looking line of path wiggling its way up the hillsides onto the plateau. But we can see here that it comes in very close to the estate march, which is not a terribly logical place for a stalking path, uh, because the southwest wind is going to take your scent into the quarries where there's already a path anyway. So is this to do with stalking at all? There's the fishing lock with a branch path to it. That may have been the genesis of the lower part. It's also a lovely piece of landscape. And speaking as a geomorphologist here, um, why do we have this tiered escarpment? Most unusual for the highlands. It's the leading edge of the Moyne thrust. The start is um, difficult um, and gets worse as you get into long leggy heather. You can't follow the path, but the, the ditch is a guide. And then it plunges into the uh, ravine, goes through a little wooded dell. The OS map shows it running straight up the steep uh, wooded hillside. But in fact, my boots found this extraordinary convoluted zigzag, um, pulling yourself up by the great tussocks of heather out onto the moor. Um, the image does show the path, there it is for you. And it gets better. Um, and you can ask me uh, for the full slide set, giving you every twist and turn. This is what I've done to sort of archive standard. It climbs up the escarpment. Um, when I went up, it was in valley mists and uh, I emerged um, out of the mists. We can now make an obeisance to the patron saint of lost paths. And we can see the width of the path and this heathery thing about driving the walked line, the, the deer line to the outer edge. It could have been wide enough for a small wheel vehicle, even up here. It corkscrews, which again suggests small wheeled vehicle rather than a tight zigzag. And it's rather sweet uh, in the snow picked out from the adjacent estate, from their path, which really is lost. Uh, I managed to pick up odd bits of it, but I do not recommend the Araneke path, even though it's on the maps. It snakes across the upper plateau, very close to the estate march. It has to cross the lovely grain of the Moyne schists as scoured out by the uh, glaciers. Um, and there it is reaching the great escarpment with all these little jinks and, and twists. Very little construction work. Here's a bit of causeway making. Um, 
round all the little rocky nibs, a bit of double ditching and a bit of making up across a difficult bit. And then the final rise um, up onto the plateau. And this is just splendid. I couldn't do all of it because of the snow patch. The ptarmigan were keeping guard at one of the jinx, and it is still corkscrewing rather than zigzagging. Beautifully conceived, beautifully engineered, and you come out onto the plateau, um, you look down onto where you've been, um, there's the line that we followed across this really beautiful landscape, otherworldly landscape, and a good day, the, the vistas out. Uh, these mid-level um, ridges, uh, shoulders, are the viewpoints, not the higher ridges, um, not, not the higher peaks. The, somewhere like the six or 700 meters up is where you want to be for the superb views and photography today, drawing and sketching in those days. Uh, from up on this little plateau, you can see the main drag uh, coming up from the lodge. You can make a circuit and go back down there, or you can pick up the zigzags onto the, the skywalk along Skonefetig, which I've done, but in snow where I couldn't really take photographs of the path. Moving on east to Lord Wimborne's later acquisition of Glencarran and then Glenuig, he created Glenuig Lodge, which is really just a glorified shepherd's cottage. Um, and he made a path from the back door of the lodge up the valley wall, trough wall onto the Morusk Plateau. And you can see in the service of research, uh, the overnight frosts on my tent <clears throat> last uh, March, April. And the sun, the early morning sun is, is lovely to bring out the detail of this path. Um, you can also see that this is one of my rock slope failures. The whole mountainside is bulging out. Um, and breaking up the steepness of, of, the, of the trough wall. And that's why they've chosen this line to go up. Uh, and there's the path dotted in for you. And you can see that it's got a more sweeping lower character and then it's tighter higher up, just as we saw at Glencarran Lodge. What they didn't factor in was gully erosion, <clears throat> serious gully erosion, uh, partly because of, of the whole valley side being a failed slope. Um, and the ends uh, of, of many of the zigzags have been lost to this gullying. Very beautifully engineered, very regular, uniform six foot width up to midway and then reducing to four foot in the tighter, higher zigzags. And I have a hunch that this midway spot uh, was a sheltered hollow, springs, grazing. Maybe this is where the pony would be rested and would wait for the walking party to come back down or would wait for the deer carcasses to be dragged down to it from wherever. Um, these extraordinary landforms are part of the rocks of failure as the highly inclined uh, strata go into the blend side and the zigzag has exploited one of these smooth upper slopes um, to get up to the plateau. Um, it's very sweet indeed. I think they could have found a much easier line by going wider, but they've chosen the hard way. Looking down, you get some idea of the steepness. And as we look across the glen, can you see there's a sort of blurry smur of movement coming in there, just as we saw at that bifurcation up the head of Glen Curry. Well, the OS have gone and mapped that as a path from their Southampton screens. Uh, without putting their boots on the ground or consulting locally, there is no path. I know one or two people who've tried it and have been disappointed, well, very cross. Um, it's a deer highway and they diverge. Don't believe everything you see on the maps. The upper zigzags inspired me to do some experimenting on what it's actually like to design and build a zigzag. So down the back of where we live on the Black Isle, there's a wooded ravine um, and in the old day, they made um, scenic walks up the burn and then across the burn, several points, waterfall, back down the sides. Really quite uh, exciting walks, actually, uh, when you clear away the Rodeo jungle. And I've made this Z equals three um, experiment in stalker path making. The linear bits are easy. Cutting the zigzags, cutting the, the tight corners, takes a lot of thought and planning and engineering delicacy. Uh, and Anne um, had the, the honour of inaugurating this new um, 
recreational path. Um, and she pronounced it perfectly serviceable. So thank you, Anne, for all your support and encouragement, uh, not least coming up there. Crossing the main watershed to the east flowing glens, I'm going to give you a very quick look up Strathconnan. Uh, this was the dull, boring one I showed you at the outset. Uh, Strathconnan is rather thinly populated uh, with, with paths. Um, there is the circuit of Bacchanai. Uh, it has been a bit messed around by quad vehicles, but parts of it are quite good. And there are these main routes across hill paths to the various properties in Orin. And of course, there is a path mapped down Orin, which we'll look at later. This estate has three very short zigzaggy stalker paths, two off the Bacchanai circuit, and this one we're going to look at up Benveen, uh, which is fairly easily reached up the um, estate um, Land Rover track from Invercurran. It's very short um, and six zigzags, uh, and it's in pretty good condition. It hasn't been used by vehicles happily. It branches off from the new Land Rover track, which means that the original start, which is off the old path that's vanished into the bogs, the original branch is now rather hard to find. You have to backtrack and find this lovely moraine ridge, and there's the path coming along the moraine crest. And on the satellite image, you can see the real start uh, up there. Oh, I keep losing my cursor. The real start is there, not this um, pull in there. And it's a lovely line coming along the Marine Crest. And then we get, get onto the hill. Hard to see where the path goes. You just have to let your boots nose their way up it. And there it goes. OS get you that far. Um, not tight zigzags, uh, gentle curves. And then from there, path head cairn. Someone has been looking after this path. Little cairns, little bits of drainage right there. And we come up to this lovely viewpoint brow. This would be a great picnic spot. I have found a good many paths that seem to lead you to a vista where you would want to take your ease. You could rest your ponies, you could sit and draw, sketch, converse, poetize, or go on higher up the next zigzags, which the satellite imagery suggested I would find. And yes, there it goes, rising up the next tier out onto the summit plateau, but not all the way to the summit mysteriously because the terrain is still quite rough um, to get to the summit, uh, which is well worth arriving at. Another of these mid-level viewpoints, um, wonderful outlooks, including the head of Glen Orin, which is um, described by the Hill Shepherd, uh, Ian Thompson in Isolation Shepherd. He had his flocks up the head of uh, Mona uh, before that was drowned, and he re recounts driving his flocks to and fro the estate base down at Fairburn through Glen Orin. Well, the early maps show the path over the choice of coals. Telephone interruption, I thought that might happen. <laughs> um, uh, over from Mona. Um, and the original maps show it stopping there and crossing over to the Corran Gap and then carrying on down uh, Glen Orin, which is now the reservoir. And only the latest metric maps show a link there. So when Ian Thompson was driving his flocks, he was partly on a mapped route and partly not. Well, let's look at what that really means. The quad vehicles use this section, uh, so that makes it stand out in the landscape, but it wasn't a made path. It was just a route. It was a single track worn trod, now doubled by the quad vehicles. But where it crosses rough ground, it's not a made path. If you were, this is called a bridle road on, on the map, by the way, implying suitable for a horse. You wouldn't ride through there. Um, it's much too intricate. You would get off your horse and lead it. We complete our circular tour of the study area by coming into um, Strathfarra and Glencanich. And at the head of Glencanich, um, tragically, the Banula Lodge um, estate by Loch Maladoc was drowned out by the uh, reservoir there. There was a fine network of paths radiating um, from up there, uh, as we can see on this vintage of map. Um, every little side valley, every shoulder had an excellent path 
up it, um, which tend to, to be still visible today, although fallen out of use because of the access difficulties. Uh, you can come up uh, great expense on the high speed ferry boat. Uh, the stalker today runs it uh, January to July um, and he will drop you um, not far from where the lodge is drowned. You can pick up a very good um, state road that goes up into this quarry and not on any Ordnance Survey map. This is one of the few that has completely escaped mapping short, sharp stalker path up this very steep shoulder, and then it gets you onto the Unreavacan uh, Maladoch skyline, and you can enjoy strolling on the house content. Very good estate road still, and you can see a nice little borrow pit, quite a few along this track. My son pointing to the excellent uh, surviving fabric uh, where it's been protected from any water erosion. And then we looked for the path um, going up that bluff. Uh, you can think about can you see it? What can you see? Um, there it is, in fact. Uh, we didn't find the middle bit, probably just lost in, in the grass. We didn't hang around to try and find it. Um, and it's actually very good higher up. Tight zigzags, you wouldn't get a wheeled vehicle up it, but ponies would probably get up at least so far. It's not six foot wide, but I think you might lead a pony at least to this stance, uh, where there's a broad uh, ledge, a resting place, um, and a, a vista round into the next quarry. And then it carries on, very narrow, just two or three feet wide, just a little nick cut in the hillside. And you come out onto the brow, lovely views across uh, to the Afrix. The estate has paths on that side just as much as this side. Um, here's one which I, my zoom image didn't quite capture full square, but it got enough of it. Um, I haven't yet done it. My boots are crying out to go and do it. And it's one of these paths that stops midway and you wonder why. Well, it's about where the pony gets to, not where the stalkers go to. And to finish off with Strath Farah. Um, now, I hate the name Brolin Estate, doesn't look right. The old map says Brulin, which looks a lot better. Um, and it, it has a modicum of stalker paths um, running up the side valleys, but unfortunately, nearly all made very close to the burn um, and either partly or completely lost to burn erosion. Um, this is an exception where just out the back door of the lodge almost, um, maybe a kilometre further up the road, um, a very late path joins the map. The interwar edition, it goes up as far as a little fishing loch uh, and with a little unmapped branch off it, which we will also look at, uh, which is tucked in there. Notice we are right in the corner of the estate with Mona and Strathconnan uh, hemming it in. So you might immediately start thinking, well, what was the point of a stalker path in right in the corner of your estate? And then the second part, not mapped until the metric era, goes right up onto the skyline. And that is the highest point in my study area reached by any path. Um, and that would be high for anywhere in Scotland. Uh, and it is really quite an, an achievement to make a path that high. My grandson on this occasion, I'm pointing him at his second Munro. Um, <clears throat> and he is showing us that there's been a bit of uh, recent remaking of the path where there's been erosion, but good surviving sections of, of the old surface. Uh, nice water crossings, a uh, bit of a washed out ford, and that's taking us up as far as the fishing loch, beyond which uh, today's hill walkers usually come down off the Farrah's skyline ridge, and because they're coming down, they miss out the zigzags, which have fallen out of use. We didn't even see them. And then the path takes this extraordinary high line um, up the Corrie headwall, um, just at the foot of the crags. And that's the Google image, and that's it in the flesh. And it, it is a, a very entertaining path indeed. Um, almost no zigzags, there are some people heading up it. There's my grandson getting going, shooting ahead. Um, and it's actually quite exposed in one or two spots. Um, quite a feat of engineering, final jink out onto the skyline. And then you are looking over the crest down into the northern quarries on Strathconnan estate. So coming up that path in full view of any deer, you've probably driven them over the crest if they were in that uh, side, and now you can't get them. So this is not 
surely a path made for stalking. In fact, they could have taken the path of a much easier line up those gentle open slopes um, from the loch. They've deliberately chosen a spectacular line um, under that crag, and they've built this branch, never mapped. We spotted it like one of these little nicks, and we followed it up to the coal. Uh, a wonderful viewpoint is the path is clearly being made for the benefit of this dramatic view up somebody else's estate. Deer in there aren't yours. So my grandson, well pleased with his second Munro. Why this particular Munro did I choose for him? He's in trainers, living in southern England. Uh, you don't buy him a new pair of boots so the mate is growing for every annual visit. So this is one Munro you can do in trainers because of this unusual and superb path. Now, Roland has been keen that I should wrap up and summarize um, what, what we think is going on here. Before Victoria and Albert um, set the fashion for Highland Estates, there were no made ways in this study area or in most of the Highland interior. The one exception here, Arrowsmith depicts the um, Conan Estate carriage road, which Osgood recounts as a, as a boy, uh, the family decamping to the west coast with carriages and carts and, and their baggage and sort of painstaking progress uh, to get round by Achnasheen. And yet the OS maps tell us that at least three quarters of the paths are made by the Great War, probably more, probably most of the paths are in existence and have been created within a few decades. So that is a transformation in access to the interior. Multiply that up. Um, you may notice this is area SP9. This is the original Munro's tables area nine of 16. So multiply that up by let's say 10 or 15 times. So we've got well over a thousand stalker paths across the islands, several thousand miles of path making, and that's over and above the broader hill uh, roads and, and the state drives. So I think that justifies the term phenomenon. Um, and beyond it being um, an access into the wilds phenomenon, it's also about ascent. <clears throat> I've commented before on how these paths are short and not very high. So that's the average um, thousand feet ascent uh, in this study area. Uh, multiply, sorry, um, but nevertheless, uh, a third climb higher than 2000 feet. So on average, they may be relatively low level features, but a minority um, do get up quite high. In fact, eight reach Corbett height over two and a half thousand feet. And I'm thinking deliberately here in the imperial measurements of the Victorian era. So that has encouraged me to um, guesstimate that a healthy minority were designed and made for their recreational value. So I think we have a, a mania here. Um, we, have a, we have various transport uh, manias in, that, in this time. We have the canal mania, we have the railway mania at about the same time, 1845. Um, and I think the stalker path mania is part and parcel of um, the creation of these Highland estates as bases for entertainment. This is your journey north from southern England, from London, or wherever your lands were in the south. And this is about decamping to the north, to the highlands, for some months. You are not going to go deer stalking every day. Your, whether it's your family, your friends up there for months, your business associates, your social world, and political guests. I have read many diary accounts of politicians, members of the House of Lords, cabinet ministers, even prime ministers, who love to be invited up to these estates for a week or two. Not stalking, shooting, fishing every day. And I think the, this is part and parcel of the Victorian love of fresh air and exercise and the landscape. Now, we must remember that that was highly exclusive and jealously guarded. So I would like to suggest that these Highland lodges very expensive, you know, huge sums were invested in creating these lodges and all the accoutrements. They are the super yachts of that time. And the super yachts you see photographed in uh, Mediterranean marinas are not there for 
travel purposes. They're not there to take people from place A to place B. They are entertainment bases. And okay, they might swan around, around uh, across the, 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 the sea waters for, for jaunts, but they are entertainment. So that is why I have condensed the awkward term stalker's path with its floating apostrophe and plurals uh, to stalker path, because every time we say or read stalker path, it reminds us this is a kind of path in its design and purpose, but it's multi-purpose. It's a new way of enjoying the mountain areas for recreation. Actually, I should mention here that these paths and roads were not always popular with the local people. Remember that the local people were barefoot or thinly shod and their beasts were not shod either. And we do read accounts of the local people resisting and resenting these made paths because they found it much more comfortable to walk on the natural vegetation or to follow the, the worn routes worn by the deer. Now, I speculate, and I would love to know if anyone is, is uh, well versed in these things, have read up the literature. When did the term stalker's path come in? Remember, Grimble and other sources, uh, pony paths is what they were called at the time. So is, is the term stalker's path something that has come in with the opening up to the wider public, where there wasn't really too much thought given to the purpose of these paths. It was just assumed they were to do with the deer stalking estate. And I also want to put in a very brief reminder that this is not a Highland invention. People had already gone to the Alps and come across, as I did as a student, um, this horror of 35 zigzags um, out the back door of the youth hostel in Overstorf up onto the nearest hill. Um, and people were familiar with the Alps from the Grand Tour um, and visiting the Alps for alpinism and well-made paths were long established as a feature of alpine tourism. So perhaps the people investing in Highland stalking estates uh, as entertainment bases, we're adding in a little frisson of that Alps experience by deliberately taking paths higher and by more exciting routes than were strictly needed for deer stalking. And not just in the tourist areas such as the Alps, even quite remote mountain ranges like Northern Romania, you can see beautiful paths zigzagging up to their summits, probably made in this case by socialist or communist um, youth groups or, or um, hill clubs for their own local enjoyment. Now, Roland's uh, Backdoor Hill, we've already mentioned, and Roland provides me with a wonderful quote to preface my study after his Glen Karen Nossas experience. Uh, the realization of what this did to the Highlands in such a short space of time, which few people have really um, thought about. Uh, it's a fresh realization. It's a fresh realization to me. And that is one of the finest uh, satellite images of the, the upper reaches of his back doorstep path, which he is going to take us up on a Nosas walk someday, we hope, with lots of other archeological interests along the way. So the two take home points are the rapidity of this invasion of the interior uh, from difficult to get to, to nowhere beyond a day's walk out and back from a lodge. And Think about other purposes. These are multi-purpose paths, and some of them uh, pretty specifically, I think, for recreation, entertainment, status, prestige, almost there's a colonial thing going on here, making your mark on the landscape, showing that you've come in and you now own it and control it. I wanted to dedicate the study to the men who made these paths. Can I find a picture? Nope, I've searched for a whole morning on the way, cannot find a picture of path makers or menders. So the, the standing surrogates are these quarrymen, but um, it, the, the, I would love to have more input from, from colleagues who know about their way around the records, such as straight after the Chapletham meeting, Jonathan Wordsworth went into the library and gave me a list of various sources uh, which make passing mentions of path creation. Always called pony paths, not stalker paths. So thank you, Jonathan, for that. But what he's really underlined is that, they are, that these records are very few and far between. We just don't know who made the paths, when and why. 
And I love this Van Gogh image, which I put in as my final substitute, because it's a great picture. You can hardly see the road makers, which I think says quite a lot. Hidden heroes. Thank you very much.